Hi everybody, welcome to this presentation. Uh, I'll be talking English because I most, uh, well, not most, everybody here talks English. And um, uh, we are very happy to, to welcome you here today uh, on this presentation of the Meta Impact Framework and uh, what we have been doing for the last week on this uh, seminar. Uh, this seminar com is, is composed of people coming from all over the world, from, uh, from many different continents. Welcome, come on in. Yeah, we, we come from all over and we are gathered here uh, for a purpose, for it's, it's three, three main purposes. First purpose is to get to know and, uh, and get to work with the model, uh, the Meta Impact model, which is the Wisdom Economies model that uh, Dr. Sean Harkins, that is sitting here in the front, has uh, been developing for a few years now. Uh, the second impact, se second, uh, second uh, goal of ours is to work with our own projects that everybody here brings with them from home and uh, use the Meta Impact Framework to further those projects and get traction in their, in, it's in our home country. And then uh, the third one is to give something back to the Icelandic community in a way of, of, of looking at uh, a kind of a, an overarching Meta narrative, to use a fancy language, which means just a theme for the whole week of what we are working with. And we choose one theme, and that's health and uh, both in general and also focused on the health system. And we got some wonderful guest speakers, some of which are here today and will be introduced later, uh, to speak to this issue of health in general and health, the healthcare system in Iceland. Uh, now, to the participants in the, the seminar, we have participants that, that cover a wide range of, of expertise. And, uh, not yet. And, uh, and this, this model here is the, this is a um, picture of the framework that we're using. And when we talk about capitals, usually we, we think about financial capital. If we, if we see like Capital Investment Corporation, it's about investing or financial capital. But this model works on, on uh, 10 different capitals. And we can look at each capital and, uh, and it's like a window into reality into different, into our shared reality, different windows, different perspectives. And we're using those perspectives to gain, gain a better understanding of this reality. All of us uh, that have, have participated in the seminar have different, uh, different uh, expertise. And these are represented in the, the, this here uh, picture that we made. So we have artists and musicians in the culture and historians in the cultural capital. In social capital, we have political activists. Then we have the knowledge artists and educators in the knowledge capital. Psychological capital is psychologists. Spiritual capital, hospice workers and counselors. And then we have in the health capital, healthcare professionals and organizational leaders and developmental coaches in the human capital. Uh, aerospace engineers in the manufacturing capital, CEOs and entrepreneurs that, that need to be highly skilled in the financial capital to make things running, and environmentalists in the natural capitals. So the, when the group comes together and work with this model, we can discuss through these capitals, and that's why we are here, and that's what we're going to represent to you today, our, our, our basic kind of findings and our methods for working with the capitals. So for, for the next speaker who is going to introduce more what we've been doing and who has been working with us, uh, please welcome Claudia Megling. Thank you so very much. So my name is Claudia and I originally come from Germany. I lived in Iceland for over eight years and uh, currently living in uh, California, Northern California. And when we put this program together, we were really thinking, so who are the thought leaders in Iceland who we can invite? And while there is a lot of people to pick from, what we ended up really finding a couple of people who are instrumental in the awareness changing of Iceland. Um, and our focus, um, we'll talk about this in a moment, in our joint project was healthcare. 
So we were very proud and happy to invite uh, Anna, from, who is a senior advisor of the Landspati Hospital, so to say, Landspitali, uh, and the University of Iceland. So she gave us a lot of information about the healthcare system in Iceland, gave us the cultural framework. Uh, then I'm also very, very happy so that we could invite Bala. He's a dear friend of mine for many, many years, and he's really instrumental for the startup scene in Iceland uh, and uh, helped us uh, shifting our focus also into the role of technology in our future economies. And then uh, on the academic field and also one of the wisdom carrier and activists uh, in the field of new economies in Iceland, uh, uh, Professor Kristin Valla uh, from the uh, University of Iceland and she's teaching sustainability there. And then uh, to round up uh, the whole framework, we invited uh, Lilia Ottostotti who is the founder of the natural um, uh, health school, um, the school of health mastery, and uh, learn from her a lot about the natural therapies present in Iceland. And uh, so with this, I'm handing over uh, to Tanya. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya, originally from South Africa and been living in Iceland for the last seven years. So our story, um, our purpose uh, for this multifaceted project that you're currently experiencing um, was it's an action learning experience, as you can see. Um, we wanted to give something back to the people in Iceland uh, and through a spirit of reciprocity. And we wanted to focus on issues that were both local and global and healthcare was one of them, as you can see. And what united us as individuals is our desire to make the world a better place. So our process, uh, during the process, we each individually were implicitly invited to discover our own integral whole selves within a safe, nurturing environment. And similarly, on a group level, each individual was honored as part of the whole, bringing their own unique wisdoms into the collective awareness. This was done through group projects, dialoguing and reflections. And finally, on a meta level, we're, we were, we've been engaged in integrating and understanding the gifts of Iceland and the local knowledge that has culminated in this project, and that is our final product uh, of this process. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Aspirin Hargens, founder of Meta Integral and the creator of the Meta Impact Framework. So it's great to be here today and sharing with you the results of our seminar over the last five days. So this quote I find really inspiring by John Fullerton with the Capital Institute, which is based in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I'm from. And it says, we can and must bring our economic theory and practice into alignment with our latest understanding of how the universe in our humanity works. And this really summarizes the impulse for me of creating the Meta Impact Framework, wanting to create a framework that actually really captures the complexity and the beauty of our world and our humanity, and how can we actually create economies that reflect that back to us. And so I want to share a little bit about the framework so you can understand some of the ideas that we've been working with over the last five days. So. Business, as usual, is changing. I mean, over the last five, ten years, a lot of amazing things have been happening. The game is changing, the rules are changing, and it's a very exciting time to be part of business, part of entrepreneurship. The innovation, the exploration is really creating new opportunities and the kinds of opportunities that we really need in order to address the kinds of challenges we're facing. So just to highlight a few of those to give you a sense, you know, we see the rise of conscious capitalism, you know, so doing business in a way that you know, includes the heart and, and awareness and, and being you know, committed to more than just the bottom line. Um, social impact investing and social responsibility are big themes in these new types of businesses and initiatives. We have B Corps and for benefit companies. So no longer do you have to choose between a nonprofit or a for profit business structure, as is the case in many countries, but there's new kinds of structures, new hybrid structures that really embed into them 
you know, tending to more than just the, the, stake, the shareholders, right, and expanding that to the stakeholders. There's alternative currencies, cryptocurrencies and such, in different ways of thinking about value exchange, which is a big part of our model. Um, blockchain is opening up new terrain and how we might support decentralization and autonomy and privacy um, and make financial transactions transparent. We have integrated accounting and reporting systems and the whole new economy movement are creating new ways to do business and to track the ways in which we exchange goods and the different kinds of services and externalities that we can include in that. There's the sharing economy with things like Uber and Airbnb that are really you know, disrupting industries and really making possible new ways of exchanging value and understanding how we might work together to solve bigger issues. And then lastly, there are more and more multiple capital frameworks that are emerging as a way of trying to expand the conversation from kind of the narrow focus on financial capital. So, to give you a little background on the Meta Impact Framework, it was created in around 2015. It was the result of looking at over 20 different models of multi-capital frameworks, right? So these were models that included like human capital, social capital, and financial capital, you know, or any number of the 10 that ultimately I ended up putting into the version that we worked with. So I studied these 20 plus models and looked for the patterns and looked for the reasons why certain types of capital were being included in those models and try and understand if we were to create a more integral version of that, what would it look like and how many capitals would be in it. And I ultimately landed on um, 10, which are these 10 here. And this model is being used by all kinds of organizations, nonprofits, for profits, as well as the the kind of new emerging structures that we're seeing around the globe. It's also being used by communities and groups to support their kind of coherence and keeping track of the way different members in the community are adding value to, you know, the shared mission and vision of that community. And we're also seeing it being used for global systems analysis, uh, which is part of what we did this week with looking at health and health care. So in its simplest form, there's four dimensions to the Mid Impact Framework. And you can see these kind of all in this framework. Let me stand over here. So there's four types of impact. So the deep impact, clear impact, high impact, and wide impact. So those are around there. And they are dealing with you know, these respective kind of you know, four you know, clusters of pies. Deep impact is the transformation of hearts and minds. How do we transform the way people think and feel, the mental models that they have, their experience of their somatic selves and what that might be telling them? How do we work with these interior realities of human beings and transform that? You know, as a business consultant, I often find that most of the challenges in businesses are related to this domain, right? So how do we transform that? And we refer to that as deep impact. Clear impact is the transformation of bodies and behaviors. How do we tend to our physical well-being, change our posture, our, our body language? How do we change our behaviors and our skill sets, develop the capacities and the know-how that we need in order to deal with the challenges and situations that we're navigating? High impact is the transformation of environments and systems. So how do we transform the systems that we're part of? Where are the high leverage points in those systems? How do we identify them? How do we then actualize a, a, a go-to plan so that we can you know, have these acupuncture ports and systems to really make as much high leverage change as possible? And then how do we tend to our environment, our natural environment, our organizational environment, you know, the, the buildings and spaces that we find ourselves in, the organizations that we're working in, um, the financial systems, the educational systems, the political systems. So how do we work with all of those systems in a comprehensive way and transform them to support the wholeness you know, across you know, all the different systems that are involved. And lastly, there's wide impact, which is the transformation of relationships and culture. How do we tend to the quality of connection between people? How do we increase trust and transparency? How do we support the coherence of communities? How do we honor and preserve culture and language, rituals and stories? You know, so how do we include that in our process? So you hear a lot about social impact, and social impact, 
I found is used in a way that often just is talking about these different types of impact, but is done in such a way that is sometimes confusing. And so I found that it's very useful to kind of tease it apart into these four types of impact so we could be more precise and clear about what are the kinds of impact we're wanting to have, what are the kinds of impact that we're measuring, and making sure that our metrics and our measurements are lining up with the kinds of impact that we're wanting to have. So that's the first one, the four types of impact. Then you have the 10 types of capital, which you can see written around the circle, health, human, manufactured, financial, natural, cultural, social knowledge, psychological, and spiritual. Um, we spent a lot of time this last week kind of exploring the specific details around those capitals, the different types of metrics you can use to measure them, looking at examples of how different organizations are including those capitals in their assessments, in their annual reports, and in their approach to metrics. Now I think the thing to highlight here is that these 10 capitals, while you could have more or you could have less, they feel like the optimal amount of differentiation to really cover the core aspects of any major challenge that you're facing in a community or an organization. You don't have to use all 10 in any given application, and you might actively choose to leave some out, but then you're leaving those out consciously. You're knowing that you're choosing not to focus on those capitals for any number of reasons. So it's kind of like a menu where you get to decide, okay, given this problem we're facing, what are the key capitals we really need to be aware of and work with in order to make the kind of progress we want to make? And then there are three types of data, and you see this with the 1P, 2P, and 3P. So this refers to first person, second person, and third person, which are somewhat technical terms that basically refer to the qualitative aspects of data, which is first person subjective and second person intersubjective. So the tradition of research known as qualitative research focuses on gathering this kind of information. And then the third person is what in many ways we're most familiar with, which is the objective or inter-objective slash systems data, right? So statistics and numbers and you know, the different kinds of KPIs that you know, many in the business world are familiar with. So we work with all three kinds of data in all 10 capitals. So again, in different situations, you might choose not to work with first-person data or second-person data in some of those capitals, right? So this is a meta model that gives you a lot of things to consider, and then you get to kind of pick and choose which ones are most appropriate to your situation. So those are the three types of data, and then lastly, we have four types of bottom lines. People, profit, and planet, which are the traditional triple bottom line. Um, combination and then purpose. Typically when you see um, someone or an organization expanding from the triple bottom line to four, they usually include purpose about 80% of the time. And we felt that having purpose and as a way of talking about the interiors, people's experience and meaning making, um, the psychology, the cultural dynamics was really important. So we've expanded kind of the triple bottom line to include the fourth and then we've linked the bottom lines with the different capitals. And I won't get into that here, but there's a number of important relationships between the impacts, the capitals, the type of data, and the bottom lines. And I think this is one of the things that really sets apart this approach from many others, is that we're really looking at how do these different layers of the model and of reality that they represent, how do they interface, right? And how can understanding those relationships between impacts and bottom lines or between capitals and types of data, by understanding those relationships and dynamics, then we can be more effective change agents, you know, dealing with the situations we're trying to bring change to. Next one. So, one way to summarize what wisdom economies are, are to have this list of words that capture some of the core elements that we're wanting to include. So, they're open, they're inclusive, they're regenerative, they're green in terms of sustainable, um, they're circular, transparent, integrative, and they include multiple forms of capital, right? So this is kind of a broad way of talking about wisdom economies, that we need an approach to, to economic thought and modeling that is including these qualities and elements so that our approach to the economy can actually match what we know about reality and what we know about humanity. 
So the last thing that I want to leave with you with my section here is that it feels like given everything that's happening out there, the larger movements of creativity and business and organizations and sustainability, is that something along these lines is an idea whose time has come. So, thank you. I'm Jörg, originally from Germany. The last 20 years I lived in Australia. And um, the next section of our presentation is the application of what we heard about the uh, process of uh, thinking about capital uh, onto health and health care. And a good place to start um, with a concept uh, like health is with a definition. And that was uh, given to us and still stands in 1948 by the World Health Organization. Um, which stated and described uh, a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. For the time being, that was quite a visionary uh, and ambitious statement. And if you reflect on uh, what uh, Jean just explained to us, it incorporates the whole uh, four quadrant or, or, uh, quadrants or the ten uh, capitals. Uh, in contrast to this, if we think about what does a healthcare system look like, the healthcare system has a much narrower focus. It focuses on disease, on deficit, on mending the broken. And with that kind of uh, a narrowed focus, it only addresses uh, a limited range of capitals, as you see represented on the right graph. Uh, there, the missing parts are blacked out, and it addresses mainly uh, health, um, psychological, the infrastructure questions, and the financial uh, resources. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of uh, population level health outcomes, we do know that medical care actually contributes only about a quarter to the overall health outcome. Um, However, when speaking about health, uh, often the public perception is that it's all about uh, hospitals and uh, doctors and nurses and the like. Uh, another quarter to population level health outcomes is linked to individual health behaviors, um, which relates to nutrition, exercise, sleep hygiene, um, in a way a self-discipline to, to optimize an orientation towards optimism. Uh, which is uh, clearly linked to, uh, to better overall well-being and health outcomes. And it also highlights the aspect of personal responsibility in the project of uh, healthy living. And from a policy perspective, it um, uh, links to uh, public uh, health uh, promotion and primary prevention strategies and so forth. The largest slide in the determinants of population health um, relate to uh, social and societal uh, characteristics and uh, to environmental factors. And in that space, um, Iceland has really a great wealth uh, to offer. Uh, next, please. So that leads uh, to the hypothesis that if uh, policymakers, organizations, healthcare providers, and individuals really embrace the a holistic uh, range of uh, capitals available, uh, bring attention to them deliberately and integrate them uh, then uh, along the sort of life um, spectrum from conception to uh, dying, then we will end up with a healthier population and the healthcare system uh, as such will also be more sustainable in terms of the costs, in terms of staffing requir requirements, and in terms of the capacity to care for all that need that form of care. Hi, I'm Tanya from Australia. Uh, so just, um, bit of a global context here, so I'm going to talk to you about an example um, as a way of illustrating how we can apply the 10 Capitals framework to the challenges that face healthcare. My background is in the management of healthcare services. Um, so we know where Iceland is, um, we know where Australia is. Um, I'm going to be talking about 
uh, rural South Australia, so all of the public health services um, in the state of South Australia. So that's a, hundred, a million square kilometres, about half a million people living in a very dispersed um, state. So I've um, had some really interesting presentations over the last week about um, Iceland and the healthcare system and the things that, that occurred to me again and again and again was just how much we have in common between rural South Australia and Iceland um, and a couple of things in particular that I'll go through. So um, South Australia is also a very urbanised state. Iceland is an urbanised country with Reykjavik being home to the vast majority of the population. Uh, in South Australia, um, two thirds of the population live in Adelaide, the capital city, and the rest are dispersed across those million square kilometres. Um, and this remoteness element, the harshness of the climate, for us it's probably in the opposite extreme. It doesn't snow in South Australia, we don't have glaciers and ice and hot baths, um, but we do have very hot weather in the summer uh, and frost in the winter. So quite extremes uh, of climate. Um, so, you know, there's some commonalities there in terms of the, the challenges of remoteness, harshness and dispersed population. Um, that's, you know, and the contrast of the urbanisation. Secondly, as a health system, the Australian health system is based on principles um, that are quite similar to Iceland's health system. So it's the concept of universal health care, um, that doesn't matter if you can't afford health care, the government's funded health services will uh, be available to you. Um, and there are small gap fees and, you know, so very, very similar financial model from what's been described to us this week exists between the Icelandic health system and the Australian health system. Um, and necessarily because of the urbanised state or the urbanised country of Iceland, um, that the majority of the health dollar actually gets spent in the city, in you know, the capital centre or the urbanised centre of, of Iceland or of South Australia, uh, which has big impacts from where I sit as a manager of health services in rural, um, that there is some inequity um, that gets perpetuated by the distribution of the, the financial resources into the health system. We also share some challenges with increasing pressure on the health system, uh, with the ageing population and our ageing workforce, uh, with the increasing burden of chronic diseases that come with this growth in ageing population. Uh, we also see, we both see increasing consumer expectations. You know, Dr Google's out there and people know where they go for their frontline advice uh, and that then heightens their expectations about what this health system can offer. Um, and there is, a, even though there's increasing consumer expectations, there's still this expectation of being able to um, neglect yourself and then go to the health system to be fixed. So that, that culture of dependence on the system in your time of illness. We also uh, see in Australia and, and in South Australia an increase in the expenditure on healthcare as a percentage of our gross domestic product. And some of that's attributable to these trends in more and more pieces of equipment that go ping and more medicine and the cost of those uh, things that increasingly are available to us through escalation uh, of capability in the technology space, for example. Um, the, the one bit that doesn't quite line up is that country health has a much smaller budget than um, Iceland in, in real terms and in relative terms and many more employees. So we have 8,000 employees in the public health system that work across country South Australia um, and uh, our budget is, is um, around the $800 million mark in Australian terms. So there is um, a big part of that is because as a rural health service we provide lower complexity, lower acuity. So um, the sort of high end medical services are all provided in the cities, heart transplants, um, dialysis, intensive care, those sorts of high end medical services are not provided in our rural communities. Another um, thing that's really striking, and, and Anna's presentation to us really emphasised how significant the challenges are for Iceland in the health workforce space, uh, and that's certainly no, um, not, not different at all to our experience in country South Australia. Uh, attraction is difficult, so re recruiting people in is difficult, keeping them once you've got them is difficult, and we see high rates of, of burnout uh, due to a range of factors, including compassion fatigue and the nature of the work for the health workforce is, is challenging. 
We also see with the um, changing uh, population profiles and the changing health system focus, some real um, shifts in the skill mix requirements of our health workforce and how difficult it is, it is to keep up, keep the pace up with that evolving need uh, to keep retraining our, our, the skills of our carers. Uh, we, we both experienced training pathway challenges and uh, perhaps an unhealthy reliance on overseas trained um, medical specialists and, and workforce. Um, so we're certainly not fully self-sufficient as we would like to be as a nation. Uh, and also the professional power dynamics, you know, the health system the world over, you know, there were some, there's some beautiful exceptions, but generally in the, the developed world, um, the the model still very, be ven being very medical, very doctor-centred, uh, and disempowering to consumers. Um, and then finally, there's some similarities in our health profile, um, which speaks to issues of similarities in our population health issues between rural South Australia and Iceland. Uh, we have a similar, you know, similar volume of emergency department presentations, so people have injuries that they can, um, or health catastrophes and need to come for urgent help. Uh, we have a, um, a lot of our birthing services dispersed and we heard Anna talk about how much of the birthing occurs in the remote and rural parts of Iceland. Uh, and we have similar examples of success. So where we are making traction as a health system, similar to where Iceland is in, for example, in infant mortality rates and low cancer mortality rates. Um, again, the difference is for us, um, the really complex care uh, is provided in, in Adelaide, so it's not my... Um, part of what I manage, and for Anna, that's, that is a really big pressure point for the Reykjavik Hospital uh, in the provision of um, complex specialised care, the intensive care in particular for tourists and the significant impact of tourists on, on the health system in Reykjavik. Thank you. So I want to share with you an example uh, of how in rural South Australia this issue of workforce um, has been conceptualised and how we have tackled it um, with reference back to the framework. So rural South Australia employs about 500 allied health professionals in the public health system. They are the physiotherapists, the dietitians, the occupational therapists, social workers, speech pathologists, podiatrists. And in 2009, um, I was working in the allied health workforce and policy space, and we had alarmingly high vacancy rates. Uh, in fact, at their peak, um, we had about 20% of our dietitian positions vacant, and up to 59% of our podiatrist positions vacant. Uh, in that year. So, you know, having the funding for the roles is one thing, being able to recruit and retain people in was quite another. Um, we, so it would routinely take two to four attempts to recruit to, to gain someone, so positions could be vacant for six, 12 months. Uh, and when the position's vacant, you either have to rely on a locum workforce, which was difficult to get and very expensive, or the services just can't be provided. So it's having this downward spiral effect in terms of services. Um, so the, that spoke to an attraction problem. We also knew we had a retention problem um, because we had a very high turnover, about a 50% turnover every three years. So typically our workforce was young, they would come fresh out of university, they would come and within two to three years they would leave. We would burn them out, freak them out and they would run off to the city where they had more support uh, and more access to training and development. Um, and the really, really young, inexperienced workforce with over 55% of our workforce within a one or two years of graduation. So the babies. Um, and unsurprisingly, pretty high rates of burnout. Thank you. So when we analyse analyze this issue from the TEM Capital perspective, I won't read out all of the detail, but what you can see is uh, often what is considered to be a workforce problem could be narrowly described as a human capital issue, um, or we've got a workforce problem, but actually the contributors of that problem touch on all of the capitals. So burnout is not is a psychological well-being issue. Lack of professional development support is, is lack of knowledge capital. Um, the low confidence to deliver on expected. So we had our young baby clinicians coming out, haven't even really consolidated their professional skills yet, um, having to um, learn on the run to do a broad range of things, whatever worked, walked in the door, and felt that their university training hadn't adequately prepared them for the realities of rural and remote practice. Um, I won't read all, the, all of them there, but you know they felt professionally isolated. They told us they you know, felt like it, 
They didn't get access to the training and support that they needed. It was a long way from home. Most of them came from the cities, a long way from mum and dad. Expensive to go home on the weekends, not really connected into the social network of the town. Um, unsurprisingly, high rates of sick leave, high rates of staff turnover. Um, they also felt professional identity was not strong and their purpose as a professional wasn't strong. They didn't feel that what they did was well no known or well understood or well valued by doctors and other parts of the health system. Um, and they just felt that the clinical scope demands on them, what they were being asked to do for their communities was beyond what they could do. That there was a dissonance between their skills and their confidence and what they actually uh, were required to do on the job each day. Um, so those demands exceeding their capacity provided this eternal sense of I'm not good enough, I'm inadequate to meet the needs of my community. Um, and so then we see the impacts in terms of financial, the costs of travel and being away from home and having to establish a home. And, you know, some of them, first time they've lived out of home from mum and dad. So really isolating, financially impactful, but also geographically scary. So. Um, we have a lot of kangaroos in the region where I live and right across and they're beautiful creatures but they like to hop right into your car when the headlights shine in their faces and um, it's pretty scary to be hit by a kangaroo as you're driving along and it's pretty common. Um, so the, the risks associated with driving great distances is also contributes to people, you know, the natural environment becoming a threat to people. Thank you. So then what do we do about it? Um, a range of things uh, and I won't detail them all but effectively we said what does the literature say about what works in this space and there's extensive international literature on what works. We also asked the clinicians that we had in our staff at the time so what what would work for you? What would make a difference for you? And unsurprisingly they touch on all ten capitals. So um, you know, we needed a transition to rural practice program, a specific structured learning and development approach to help them to make the transition from student to rural practitioner. Um, that we needed to have a reliable source of training support and a planned way of ensuring they would get the training they needed to fill any deficits they experienced in their confidence and skills. Um, we, had, we needed to develop more robust partnerships with universities so we could inform their undergraduate courses as being more fit for context. Uh, we also deliberately developed whole of country networks for these professionals so that they could on a monthly basis get together with other professionals like themselves to discuss what their challenges were, share cases, um, so get some nourishment but also that social capital being built was really important. Uh, and strengthening their peer networks. Just um, there were a, a range of crass ways of talking about it, but effectively we introduced our young professionals into their social lives of their communities. Um, we went on houseboat tours, we played net, mixed netball, we did those sorts of things that make such a difference to people feeling like they belong. Uh, and not expensive, not hard to do, but is about connecting people with community and really building social capital. Um, we developed clinical supervision and support and debriefing to really build the human capital and the capability of the workforce. We developed an isolated worker policy that worked out how to keep people safe when they were travelling um, so that they, there was a really clear process of how to do that. Um, buddied people up so that clinics were provided by multiple clinicians on the same day in the same town so they could travel together. You know, so a range of little things but they made a big difference. Um, and yeah, that's probably enough for now. Thank you. So the results. Within three to five years, and some occurred within three and some within five, hence the range, we demonstrated impacts on all four capitals. The, the, most, the impact that I'm most proud of is that we reduced vacancy rates to less than 5% across all of the professions. So, you know, none of these were big earth-shattering strategies, but they made a huge impact. Um, we saw increased number of applications for our positions, went from getting none for two or three rounds to getting up to 50 for a single position, which is unheard of. The mo majority of our vacant roles were filled within the first round of advertising and we were able to retain our health professionals more. Uh, we saw a 20% increase in the number of level two roles. So we, in parallel, developed a clinical uh, a career structure 
where instead of having 55% of our positions being for baby clinicians, we converted a proportion of those roles into the next level up, level two positions, and we established one level three position per region so that people could see where I could progress in my career and who do I go to who's more senior to me to provide support. So they might not have been in the same town, but they were within easy distance. Um, so really building that human capital by growing um, career structure and support structures. And we saw the average length of tenure increase by almost 12 months, which is about a 25% increase on average. Our staff reported increased levels of job satisfaction, pride, clarity of their roles and responsibilities and higher levels of optimism in their career and in their profession and the impact they could have on their communities. We also increased the number of presentations delivered at state and national conferences. So our staff were becoming proud in what they were doing and wanting to promote it at a state level and nationally. Um, and we kicked that off by holding a whole of country allied health forum and basically inviting everyone to come and saying, tell us what you're doing that's good. Let's start sharing good stories about what we're doing. And that significantly increased the social capital um, and the cultural capital within country health and the identity of what it is to be an allied health professional working in rural um, South Australia. We saw an increase in the volume of service that's being provided because we actually had positions filled. <laughs> so there were bodies on the ground to deliver services. And we saw a reduction in our re recruitment costs. It's really expensive to try and recruit to positions, especially when it's a zero outcome <laughs> process. Um, so there were financial benefits as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Um, I'm Simon. I'm the third of the Australian contingent, which only proves that we come in as, as a gang, actually. Um, and um, we've already referenced uh, Anna, who was actually our first presenter at the beginning of our week, uh, from Lance Batali. I think I've got that right. I've just been practising it all week and probably still mucked it up. Um, and when she did her presentation, which was tremendous, it really did frame things for us. And she presented a couple of key challenges. One of those Tanya's been talking to, or just has just been presenting on, in terms of workforce. In fact, I think from Anna's perspective, workforce was the overriding issue that, uh, and, and challenge that she was having to, to face and the system was having to face. But the other one she mentioned, which was actually quite prominent, was the issue of ageing. Uh, and these next two slides actually come from Anna's presentation, so I want to actually thank her for um, making these available to us. And I want to um, just focus on uh, this first one, which actually talks about the impact, well, it doesn't talk so much talk about the impact, but actually the profile of the ageing population of Iceland. Um, now, most of the population of Iceland is clearly increasing, the population of most countries across the world is increasing. But I think what you can see here as we move from 2008 to 18 and up to 23 and beyond, is that whilst we've got a bulge in the, in, the, in the overall population, you can see where much of that increase is occurring. And in many senses, in many senses, this is actually a result of a successful healthcare system, not just the system itself, but public health care uh, and general conditions in society. So we're able to keep people living longer. It's a great thing. It's a great thing from my perspective, I suspect for most in the room. So what we're experiencing, what Iceland is experiencing, is this bulge and this is going to continue. Now, this isn't a tsunami. Um, and if I showed graphs like this for countries like Iceland, uh, sorry, like, uh, countries like Japan or some of the other European countries, you'll see a much steeper curve which probably places Iceland in a very good position to try and address this issue now because there are other countries that have already faced a much uh, larger explosion in the ageing population that, that Iceland has. But it is a significant issue. And the reason it's a significant issue uh, is as a result of these first couple of points on this next slide. And in many senses, I think this is probably pretty self-evident. Older people, because of their frailty, are more likely to have at least one chronic disease, and in fact, 50% of them have two or more chronic diseases. As we age, as our body deteriorates, you know, we're more prone to have uh, and susceptible to these chronic 
illnesses. And it's those chronic illnesses that are putting pressure on Iceland's healthcare system. And in particular, what we heard from Anna was the pressures that were placed on the hospital system. So we had certainly hospital admissions that were starting to rise reasonably dramatically, putting pressure on beds. And in fact, it was then also difficult, we heard, for um, people to exit hospital, particularly for older people who had no options to actually go to. If they couldn't go back to live safely at home, they didn't have the care available within the home, they had to remain in hospital. And that impacted not only on their wellbeing, but on the wellbeing of all Icelanders, because it meant that there was bed blockages which actually stopped other people who should have had access to hospital, and we heard examples of this for, for treatment, who couldn't get in to the hospital, couldn't get access because those hospital beds were being blocked. Now, that's the negative side of things. We thought there's an opportunity to reframe this to some extent. If I can go to the next slide, we've just got a few pictures. There's no doubt when you're actually facing the sorts of pressures that we've just described that you can actually look at ageing as being a problem. And that older people, in a sense, are a deficit. Yes, we thought that there's another way of framing this, a much more positive way of framing this, is that older people are not so much a problem but ultimately a solution. And actually, there's an enormous opportunity that there are assets, they're not deficits, they're assets. They have things to contribute, to continue to contribute to society, not only to their own families, to their own well-being and their own health, but to the community at large. And they're an asset sometimes that we don't tap into. We see them as a burden. So... The things that we thought through during the week is we had presentations from others who actually provided us a different perspective, not only on ageing, but on alternative medicine and alternative healthcare approaches. So we thought we could come at this problem from a, a somewhat different perspective. And we offer these ideas as ideas um, to be explored further, um, certainly to be um, ex examined in much greater detail. And I want to just quickly run through these into the, next, uh, into the next slide. So these are our key reflections. As I said, we think there are opportunities that, that require some further exploration. We certainly encourage some further exploration. The first one relates to the impacts of isolation and disconnection. Um, we don't think this is a phenomenon that is peculiar to older people as they age in Iceland, and certainly we've seen this in Australia, and I think as we've discussed it with the group, during the week, these are experiences that are happening in many countries for older people. As they lose partners, as they become frailer and less able to get out and about, quite naturally they become more isolated and more disconnected from their natural community, their friends and their families. And that creates, um, that creates problems. Um, I don't think we have an epidemic yet of loneliness, but I think it is certainly an emerging problem. And so what we thought would be worthwhile exploring are, are three options, and these aren't detailed, or we haven't provided any great detail of, for, for any of these, so these are a little bit more than thought bubbles, but are things that we think are worth exploring. And I think if you look at it in the context of uh, the Meta Impact Framework, all of these ideas are really trying to uh, enable uh, an attachment to some of the capitals are not strengths at the moment in terms of the way we actually view healthcare for older people, not just in Iceland but probably in most other places around the world as well. If we look at older people in the health system as problems, as deficits, we think of them primarily as a cost to the system. So the capitals that tend to get emphasised generally are ones around finance because of the cost in, in post but also in terms of infrastructure. So the pressure becomes to think about how do we solve this problem by creating more hospital beds, by be building bigger hospitals that can actually accommodate this additional demand. What we've tried to come through with all of these uh, ideas and suggestions is to actually try and um, utilise some of the other capitals that are probably underutilised in this space. 
in particular, like the spiritual capital, the psychological capital, and the knowledge capital. If we once again think of older people as assets rather than deficits as, as contributors, these are contributions. They have enormous wisdom, and, and unfortunately, often enormous untapped wisdom. We wanted to emphasise the social and cultural capitals as part of the wide impact. And we thought there was enormous opportunities, and we heard great examples during the week of how to actually utilise the natural resources of this country, the beautiful outdoors that we have here, the hot springs, etc., that uh, that are in abundance, and the natural uh, remedies that sort of come from the land. So when we look at isolation and disconnection as the first challenge, we thought the first opportunity really rested around how we could utilise um, that the, the national the natural uh, elements of the land uh, that we're actually in, the thermal pools. And we heard great examples of older people who naturally congregate in the thermal pools. We had a great example of a choir. And in fact, it wasn't just a choir for old, that engaged older people who, who congregated naturally at one of the thermal bars um, or pools, but it actually was intergenerational. We actually had younger people who naturally actually joined that. And, uh, you know, I mean, when I hear stories like that, I mean, it's, it's tremendously heartwarming because, you know, what we're then seeing and what we're experiencing is, is the beauty and the benefits of actually having different generations come together. So we think that there are opportunities to certainly leverage those natural resources in a much more significant way. The second, the second dot point under that topic of isolation and disconnection relates to connecting. Once again, I guess on the intergenerational theme, um, of older people within our education and childcare institutions to actually create a much uh, more obvious uh, linkages between older people and younger people. And once again, to actually allow older people to utilise their assets, their wisdom, their knowledge for the benefit of younger people and in turn re, re um, vitalising uh, older people too. And the third area that we thought of is that there is probably some opportunities potentially to actually connect and utilise the resources within some of the more traditional institutions in ISAN as, as well to actually benefit older people. And the church was one of those that came to mind. The second area that we focused on was the deteriorating physical and mental health um, that's associated with those chronic illnesses that are more prevalent amongst older people. But we wanted to come at this from a prevention angle. The third dot point relates to how we actually meet demand. This is about how we might work to actually prevent demand. And at the core of this was how we could actually use the opportunity to promote a greater focus on self-care. And we heard some great examples uh, during the week of self-care and um, how impactful that was on reducing illnesses, um, not only preventing them, but in some ways actually people treating their own illnesses in ways that were perhaps far more effective than, than uh, conventional medicine and, and health care. We thought there's an opportunity to actually expand on this more so, and that really is a bit of a cultural shift in terms of the way healthcare systems need to operate. There's a requirement for healthcare professionals and the workforce to think differently about encouraging self-care as a core component of the way that services and, and health treatments are provided. We also thought there's perhaps an opportunity to actually run a pretty significant health education program that actually encouraged self-care and the benefits of self-care, people taking responsibility, people having access to their own information about their health is a starting point in this, but um, enabling people, not only older people, but this is what we've focused on here, to take much greater responsibility and control over their own health. And by doing so, prevent that sort of progression into illnesses and, and chronic conditions. The third area we focused on was the treatment of chronic diseases, and so therefore how do we meet demand. Uh, Anna, in her presentation earlier in the week, already identified a gap in the system in Iceland around residential aged care, a pretty obvious um, alternative pathway, particularly to help older people exit the hospital or to avoid hospitals and actually live in uh, a home-like environment uh, that is much more appropriate and ultimately much cheaper than hospital care. 
But we also I thought that um, there was probably more opportunity to think of um, a more expanded home care environment for older people too, which wasn't just about providing treatment and healthcare services, although that needs to be part of it into people's own homes, but to also enable people to live longer, more independently at home by helping with practical things from shopping to showering and to, and to gardening and the like so that people can actually retain uh, an independent lifestyle and continue to live in dignity and have less demands on our healthcare systems, on the Iceland healthcare system, by actually having a suite of services that can be provided in the home. So once again, these were the ideas that came up through our discussions during the week. They provide a frame for a way of thinking about how we might address the issue of ageing in a positive and constructive light in the future in, in Iceland, and we think there's some, some room for some greater exploration. And on that note, I'll finish and invite Sean back to the podium. So I want to build on what Tanya and Simon did um, by kind of zooming us out to the MetaView. They went into really specific issues that Iceland's facing and explored how we might think of and approach those issues from a 10 capital, you know, meta impact perspective. So I want to zoom us out and share with you some of the key questions that we ended up holding as a group. You know, so over these last five days, you know, we've heard from a lot of different um, guest speakers. We've had people from Iceland actually in the seminar contributing their insights and experiences. We've also chatted with you know, people throughout the week you know, um, in our own, kind of going to restaurants and interacting with people um, in Reykjavik. And so in that process, we've, we've been exploring this kind of gap between health and healthcare and how might a meta-impact approach help us understand how we might close that gap, how we might have healthcare actually include a wider range of capitals and value than what it currently does so that it can support well-being physically, emotionally, um, and physically in a, in a much more robust way. So we spent some time today kind of bringing together kind of the core questions that we're leaving with. And so we're leaving Reykjavik, many of us, you know, over the next few days and going back to our communities and our organizations. And so these are the questions that are living in our hearts. And so we wanted to offer them up to, to you and to, to the Iceland in general um, as just an offering of, of questions that you yourselves might consider or use these to think about your own situations where you might apply uh, an expanded framework like the Meta Impact Framework to the situations you're facing. So we're using the frame of the, the four types of impact and what's a key question that arises in that space that can help have more impact in this context. So we start with deep impact, and the question is, how can I, or how can Iceland coordinate its knowledge resources, for example, specialist expertise and databases, um, to overcome challenges associated with seasonal depression, ADHD, and caregivers burnout, right? So, so those challenges seem to be really big ones that came up many times from different people that we spoke with. And when we look at the, the knowledge and the expertise and the things like the decode genetics, like we see some powerful assets and possibilities. And so how might Iceland find a way to leverage some of the, the strengths and assets it has in these types of capital, spiritual, psychological, and knowledge, to address some of the bigger challenges that also occur within those particular capitals. So next we go to clear impact, um, which again, is about transforming um, bodies and behaviors. And so here, the question that we ended up landing on together is what would the future workforce of Iceland's healthcare system look like if it shifted from a primary focus on treating illness to promoting thriving health? And so this got highlighted very powerfully in Tanya's presentation, right, where they looked at the staffing issue in Australia and by kind of using the MedImpact framework, really changed how they were thinking about that issue, right? So how do we not just focus on the staffing issue from the box of staffing, right, and from kind of a, you know, human capital, HR kind of training perspective, but how do we step back and get a meta view and think about it from, you know, a number of different perspectives so that we can bring some creative solutions that might not show up within kind of the more narrow confines of how that issue is currently being framed. 
And high impact is the transformation of environments and systems. And the question that kept coming up in various contexts was, given Iceland's natural resources, um, might you become a global leader in hydrotherapies, right? So the, the hot water and the cold water and, and, and using them in conjunction. And there's increasing scientific evidence um, and understanding around how to use the hydrotherapies to great effect. And some countries are already doing this and incorporating it into their healthcare systems. So it just seemed like low-hanging fruit to us that like, well, Iceland has this possibility in abundance, so might they begin more systematically you know, looking at how they could build on that tendency, which is already here, um, and really incorporate it more formally and fully into the healthcare system. And lastly, wide impact, which focuses on the transformation of relationships and culture. How might Iceland leverage its high connectivity? You know, everywhere you go, you know, you know people. I was with Arnie today. We went to three different places, and he bumped into someone he knew in all three places. And so it was like this example of kind of this high connectivity in Iceland, um, which is so delightful. So how might we leverage that, and, you know, as well as the startup communities um, around business and entrepreneurship, um, the arts and culture, which is an abundance and, and quite an amazing feat, given how small the population here is, given the, the creativity that emerges um, from Iceland. And how might we leverage that to improve the population health and the well-being? We heard lots of examples of art programs being used in the context of healthcare systems in other countries and other locations. You know, so that helped us realize that this asset that Iceland has in terms of the social connectivity, the cultural, the unique cultural identity, um, the arts and the creativity, that those are things that we can leverage and fold into supporting not just health, um, but also the healthcare system. So, to end, I want to share with you some artwork that emerged in the group at a particular poignant moment um, where after hearing, um, I think it was Lilia and her presentation, there was just a buzz in the, in the room because there was a lot of connections that were happening and two members ended up drawing essentially the same image. Um, you know, so Michael's is up here at the top and then Tanya's is here. And you know you have fire and ice, and I know that's a bit cliche in the Icelandic context, but it also has this powerful mythological power, you know, this this archetypal energy. And so we were thinking about the hydrotherapies and the, the hot water and the cold water, and we're playing with these images of this polarity and how can we work with that? And then you have the water coming up between the fire and the ice, you know, the hydrotherapies. And, and kind of integrating that. And so we were kind of exploring, you know, the upsides and the downsides of those polarities and how to create an approach that really amplifies the upside of each. Um, and so for me, this was a, a glorious moment because it showed how um, the connectivity in our, our own field of action, learning, and research had two individuals have this aha moment where they were seeing possibilities of how to relate to Iceland and it's amazing, you know, kind of cultural heritage and its natural resources um, and, and bringing it together to deal with a particular issue in Iceland. So it felt like an appropriate thing to, you know, kind of end on. I think we might have, yeah, so let's go back. Just another way of, of seeing it. So, so thank you so much for being here with us today and, and hearing kind of the results of our seminar and the presentation that we brought together. I want to thank all of you, thank all the presenters who came up and shared their piece. So thank you so much. <laughs>